So my name is Amy Janess. I'm programming coordinator for the Nantucket Athenaeum, which is the public library on Nantucket. And um, I wanna welcome you. I wanna let you know that we are recording this and it will be available on our YouTube channel. If you know anyone who can't join us tonight, please encourage them to watch it there. Um, and then at the final part of tonight's presentation, uh, we'll take questions. So as we go along, if you think of a question or you have a comment, feel free to put it in the chat or put it in the Q&A. You'll find icons for both of those things at the bottom of your screen. And we'll take the questions um, towards the end of the program. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction of both of our speakers tonight, and then uh, we'll get out of the way. Um, so G.A. Calderon is co-director of education, director of community relations, and an instructor at the School of Fashion Design in Boston. His work as a fashion designer has graced the pages of Vogue and Elle magazines, as well as the New York Times Sunday Style section, as well as been acquired by the Peabody Essex Museum to be exhibited in their fashion and design gallery. And Jane Conway Casp is a School of Fashion Design trustee and recruiter, fashion show producer and model. And on Nantucket, she runs Wildflower Concierge Services. So please join me in welcoming Jane and Jay and take it away. Thanks, Amy. So I just first want to thank Amy and the Nantucket Athenaeum for uh, for having us tonight. And um, just to frame this for you, uh, we wanted to talk about uh, fashion careers, but uh, it's also important to note that although we'll be framing the conversation around fashion, um, the, the skills that, that we are gonna be talking about really lend themselves to almost any discipline. So keep that in mind, even if you're not in the fashion industry. And um, I, I thought this would be a lot of fun as a conversation. Um, uh, uh, Jane and, and I go way back. We've been friends for a long time and we worked together for a long time. And, uh, and those, the nine keys that we talk about uh, are, are reference the chapters in the book. Um, so uh, I'm gonna have, uh, Jane has read the book and she has questions. She, um, and, and uh, we'll have Jane start the whole process off. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, Amy and um, the Athenaeum for having me. And I'm so happy to be with all of you um, this evening. Um, so Jay, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, what challenge does a fashion student face after leaving school? Um, well, I think the biggest challenge um, a, a around leaving school, you know, the safety of school is that at school, there is that buffer, you know, there's that time uh, that's a time where even if you have other concerns, you know, family and other jobs and things like that, while you're at school, that creative process is being protected. It's a real safe zone and you're, it's being nurtured. Um, and I think the biggest challenge is um, when, uh, when you're taken out of that, like, you know, when you, you still, you know, you know, you're creative, you got your skill set. Um, from your education, but all of a sudden you're in this real marketplace of people. You know, the industry is very competitive. So um, um, you have to figure out ways to support that process on your own. So, you know, whereas that's in school, you have your teachers, um, you know, to, to help guide you. And even the, even the act of getting an assignment, you know, most people are you know, not necessarily jonesing for, for homework all the time, but the whole idea of an assignment sets you off on a path, right? You know, it sets you out on this journey, this adventure, uh, and sometimes challenge, really challenging, but, but it's, it's a trigger, it gets you going. And to get that in the real world, when you have to deal with, uh, you know, the realities of being out, you know, in the real world, um, it can be very challenging. It could kind of, uh, allow you to reprioritize things where that's not as important. And I think that's a dangerous place to be. So, uh, you know, that really speaks to uh, building a system that can uh, keep you going, you know, keep that creative flow going. Mm -hmm. Very good. And how is being creative different in a professional environment? Well, I think the, the hardest thing about that, about being creative in a professional environment is that you, are um, you have to be creative on demand. Uh, so they're, they're not, uh, 
going to be too welcoming of someone who's like, I have to wait to be inspired. I have to wait for the muse. And, and one of the things I, uh, this famous quote, uh, a quote, uh, I think it's Chuck Close, who said, you know, inspiration shows up while you're working. And, and part of the process that you learn at school is that, um, you know, while you're in that creative process, when you get those exercises from a teacher, you can start to imagine how you're going to use this particular new skill or technique. So, um, so yeah, it's, there's not a lot of room for being, you know, uh, kind of just waiting and waiting around to be inspired. You have to uh, use all your tools and skill sets to, um, to keep that going. Um, and, and there are a lot of things you can do to get that process going. So, you know, everything from journaling your ideas, keeping folders of inspiration, doing regular research, keeping up with the trade papers, all those kinds of things. Um, but, but again, you're in charge of it, of making sure that you're maintaining um, your ideas. Uh, I love this idea of, I just heard today, idea capture like that's a part of your process. You need to not just have ideas because we all have ideas and tons of ideas throughout a day. But if you don't write them down, if you don't jot down the idea or bookmark that link or whatever it is, then it's gone. You know, you may or may not remember it later. You may go, oh, I had this great idea, but it's not fully formed or, or, or you don't have a jumping off point. So, um, so yeah, so th I think that's the biggest uh, difference between being in school and then you know once you're doing something professionally mm -hmm. and just in terms of just being creative i find you know a lot of the designers even after school if they're working on their own as a designer and then they go to work for a company in design is yeah. very different because their mind as a creative you know they're they're working they're used to working on their own timeline you know they they work and um when, you know, when they're always thinking of new ideas and inspiration, and then when they go to a, a business and um, in working for another designer, they're in a structured environment and they're, you know, given tasks and they have to meet someone else's timeline. Um, so all that is part of the whole process. But I feel the creative mind is, is really, you know, it, it, you can use that anywhere, whatever environment you're in. I think it's, you know, creative people have a way of problem solving as a designer, when you're, you know, creating a piece, a design, and something goes wrong, and you have to figure it out and figure out the best way to make it work. And we see designers do that all the time. And I, I think um, that, you know, creative thinking can be so important in, in, in a professional environment, too. So I, I think either way, you know, you can't go wrong with um, a creative way of thinking. Yeah, it's, it's really important. I mean, but there is that reality check of, like when you are working for someone else, like you said, their schedule, their timeline, their rules, even. You right, know, so exactly. <laughs> like even like seam allowance, it may be different at a different company. You need to kind of go with their structure. And, um, you know, one of the things I tell every student, and this goes for, you know, whether you're on the job or in a classroom, is your first job on any job or any project is to find out what, how your boss wants it done. Right. Not, I mean, you can definitely bring things to the conversation and suggest things, but you want to know where you're starting rather than coming in thinking, oh, I'm going to do it my way. And if, you know, if it works out great, if not, not, but right. you really do that on the job. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, and another question, how important is it for a fashion professional to have a point of view or a unique voice? Well, you hear a lot about having a unique voice, like, you know, when you watch reality television shows or competitions, I think that's great. I think, you know, you do definitely, as you mature into being a designer over time, having a unique point of view is a great thing. But I also think it could be, um, the pressure to do that can be, a, uh, have a negative effect. Um, I think if you're trying to define your voice, uh, you know, as you're studying, as you're developing, even as your first years in the industry, um, you can box yourself in and not and close yourself off to opportunities. I think instead of on the creative side, looking to have a unique voice, be curious. Like I think curiosity, thinking like a detective, an archeologist, you know, a, a scientist, however you want to picture yourself, being curious is so much more important because 
over time, what you're curious about and the unusual things that come uh, kind of come into play, you know, and get involved in the process, like you might be curious and it takes you away from fashion for a little bit into right. science or technology or the business side of it or any of those things, your curiosity about things are going to start to create that voice. They're going to become the, you know, the natural evolution of what your choices are will become that point of view and that voice. And I think it'll be bigger, it'll be more potent, it'll be more in tune with you as a, as a person if it comes out of curiosity rather than you trying to sit down and say, oh, I'm this kind of designer, right? This is what I do. So um, it's, a, it's, you know, I totally get the importance of that voice, but I think that really speaks to established companies. You know, like when you have a multi-million dollar company, yes, you should have a point of view. You know, there should be a direct, you should be able to recognize that designer. Um, I think when you're starting out as a student or your first years as a designer, it should feel like an adventure, right? Mm -hmm. And you're just taking things in, trying things out, experimenting. And it, you'd be surprised how quickly it becomes, uh, you know, you, you get a quick picture of where this person is at as a designer. And I also feel that um, young designers, that's how they learn what they're really good at. You know, I hear from designers all the time coming into school, oh, I am going to be a swimwear designer. I am going to be, you know, a bridal designer. And then when they actually take the classes, it's just like anything else in life. When you go to school, you, you know, you think you want to be a doctor. You think you want to be, you know, in finance. You have no idea until you've really tried it. Yes. So I always suggest, you know, just just try all the classes, you know, just just try get as much information as you possibly can and try as much as you possibly can. And like Jim, it reminds me, we had one um, student, Candace Wu, who when she started the school, she her you know, she her aesthetic was very dark, gothic. Everything was black, <laughs> leather, studded. You know, that was her thing. And that was, she thought, I'm going to start my business and this is going to be the way I design. And then she took a bridal class and she realized, and the instructors realized that everyone at the school said, oh, oh my gosh, she's amazing in, in bridal wear. Like this is, this is what yeah. she should be doing. And the, her, if anyone wants to look her up, her name's Candace Wu. She's, she's out of Boston, but um, she's been in Vogue and, and Elle and Harper's Bazaar and, you know, gotten the best of. Boston. And um, it was all because she opened herself up to try something new. And then that was, that was her voice. She knew that, you know, that that was what she should be doing. And now she's just really, really successful at it. Yes. Yes. It, it, I mean, and again, I, I remember from one year to the next, the transformation because right. <laughs> other work was fantastic. It was everybody loved right. it. And then yeah. she was just as good at, in, in bridal, well, even better. And she, she ran with it, you know, it became her whole career right now. So, and she's doing really well. Right. And that, that reminds me of a quote um, that I, I use kind of quotes throughout the book to punctuate some of the messages. And there's this great Ray Bradbury quote. Um, and I, I think it's the, the, the best way to look at starting and being a beginner, right? And being open to always being a student. And his quote is, learn to let go should be learned before learning to get. So at, we all want to acquire, you know, and like get our skills and move on and become a designer. But letting go of like the preconceptions, especially around fashion, right? Like um, everybody thinks they know fashion. Um, you know, you, we watch reality shows, we shop, we see fashion shows. But there's, there's just so much more if you're open to it and don't try to... Um, you know, fit opportunities into your preconceptions of what it is, let yourself be exposed to it and explore. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and how does someone sustain a successful career in fashion? Uh, sustaining, a, a, <laughs> I think the key here is to, uh, to be that perpetual student. Um, what I find, you know, and, and that ties into the whole curiosity thing as well. I find that um, one of the, the biggest things in fashion, and also as we get older, because I know I've felt this way as I get older, is are we still relevant, right? And in fashion, that's always the question. You know, are we still in style next week? <laughs> you know, is it, oh, that's so last week? Um, or, are, or are we able to keep relevant? And part of that 
is continuously being exposed to new things and content. Um, so um, that's part of that learning that you need to sustain and you need to figure out whether it's taking the occasional class, watching videos, keeping up with, the, with uh, the, what's happening in the industry, um, forecasting, trying to predict what's happening, popular culture. But uh, for me, another big one is uh, fashion history. Um, that's another thing that I teach at the school. And, but fashion history to me is more than dates and places and, you know, and remembering, you know, memorizing things. Because for me, it's the legacy that we all inherit when we decide to go into fashion. Because even if you're just a connoisseur of fashion, you love it, you wear it, knowing fashion history brings so many things to life because, uh, you know, gowns on the red carpet can be tra traced back to antiqu antiquity, you know, back to ancient Greece. Um, you know, little shift dresses or bias, the little slip dresses that you see a lot over the summer all kind of go back to the bias cut that Madeleine Vionnet pioneered. So all of those things bring it to life, give you incredible stories around what you're wearing. And, and in the end, they're just clothes, right? But they become special when we have things we can attribute to them, when we can give them those stories, those reference points. And then we have a little magic because again, it's adding something to our lives besides just covering our bodies that we have stories that we can share. So I think that's what's really important to keep a career going that's sustainable is that you're evolving. You know, Just the way the industry evolves and changes over time, you need to keep doing that too for yourself because I think we get a little trapped by what we do well you know, like all of a sudden you go, you find your niche and you're like, okay, I'm going to ride this. And granted, you ride it, you know, have some fun with it, but then always be looking for how you can take it somewhere else. You know, like, um, like lace work for bridal, let's say, right? Usually lace is a very specific thing, but thinking about technology, new technologies like laser cutting, you can make um, a, a white leather uh, a bridal gown that's all laser cut to look like lace and it's that delicate even so you can take things in all new directions and again just because you were exposing yourself to what's out there and how the industry is changing so I think um, always thinking of your thinking of yourself as this evolving uh, creative person and always feeding that machine uh, mm -hmm. with education with again like I said classes books documentaries, all that kind of good stuff. Because um, one of the things that I find in my, in my uh, uh, career is that at a certain point, fashion wasn't what was available in the fashion industry for inspiration. I had seen it before, right? You know, like, because I knew my industry so well. So the minute I, I canceled my subscription to Vogue and got my subscription to Fast Company, uh, which is a great publication that, you know, always is talking about the latest ideas. I started to go in brand new directions, you know, so sometimes it's about kind of breaking out into those, um, those other things you're curious about. And I noticed too, um, some of the most successful designers that I've worked with, they have such incredible passion and perseverance. Like I, I know there are people are passionate about what they do, but for me, everyone that I've met in the fashion industry is, is beyond anyone else with their passion. They, you know, a lot of them say I've done, you know, I started, you know, designing for my Barbie dolls. I've, this is my life, you know, and it becomes, it is, it becomes such a huge part of their life. They live, eat, breathe fashion and um, they persevere. They, whatever obstacle comes up, they, they just keep find a way to, you know, get past it and just keep moving on. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we had couture, you know, bridal designers who just pivoted their entire career, started, you know, making couture masks and, yeah. and just because they were not going to give up their, their, their passion and, and what they do. It's just, it's just part of them. Um, you know, and they just, they'll start out small. A lot of them, you know, I, one of the designers, I thought of Denise Sajar, she, she started out, she wanted to run her own business under her own label. And she worked, you know, for other designers. And, you know, she rented a small space in one of the suburbs in the bottom of a 
and below a dentist's office, <laughs> she always says. And then from there, she just kept working, building her clientele, you know, small steps. It took a lot of small steps. And then she was able to have a place in Boston um, and then moved on to boutiques and hotels in Boston and then started her own fashion boutique and then branched out to um, doing um, home goods. And now she's actually opening her third um, store um, boutique. And so it's, you know, it's all about like having that passion and just persevering and you, you can do it. I, I know like when I meet with a lot of high school students, they say, you know, this is my dream, but everyone tells me I can't do it. And I say, don't ever let anyone tell you you can't do it. You absolutely, I see it all the time. You know, I've been in the industry for 40 years and I see designers just no matter what, no one's going to tell them no. A parent's not going to tell them no. A counselor, you know, no one's going to tell them they can't make it. And they just, they do. They, they yeah. just do. It's, um, it's true. I mean, you need that passion because, um, a lot of people don't realize in the beginning how much work it is. It's so hard. <laughs> so it's a lot of hard work. Um, so again, if you have that passion, you definitely need to nurture it. I mean, at, at the school, another great example of that is uh, adults who have gone through entire careers. Um, you know, maybe the, the kids are at college now and right. you know, they have some freedom and they just they decide to go after what they were passionate about in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, they reinvent themselves and uh, start their education later, you know, or at least that particular the fashion, their fashion education. So, um, yeah, that passion doesn't go away. Like I found that it, even if it's stifled for a little while or detours, that if you if you started off with a little, uh, you know, that's that little germ of, uh, of passion for uh, for the industry, it, it, it fights its way out again. So, yeah, that's true. Very and cool. how do you recommend asking for help? Huh. This this <laughs> is really good because uh, I I do personally get asked for help a lot. So um, <laughs> and I talk to people who are in a position to offer help as well. And I want to say one word that you need to start with if you're thinking about asking anyone for help: research. I know it doesn't sound sexy, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> but. You need to know who you're asking. You need to know what you're asking. You want to frame it in such a way you want to respect other people's time, um, all those kinds of things that are kind of just etiquette, really. Um, you know, like if you're interested in a job, even you should be researching that company that you're applying to so that in the interview, you can really speak well um, about th that subject matter. But when you're asking for help, you want to get an idea. Uh, you want to have done the homework to figure out who this person is, what have they done, watch you know uh, YouTube videos if they've done shows or have done presentations or lectures. Um, but the other thing that people kind of uh, do is they lump all the categories of help into one thing and think it's one size fits all. Um, you want to know what you can ask from someone. So, for instance, you know mentorship. Mentorship is not, I know that corporations often will just assign mentors, usually within the company to support, and that's great. But when I speak about mentors, I, it's really about someone who is serving as this role model, um, this person who has done what that person wants to do. And it's about, um, you know, having these situations where you connect with that person, maybe you share what you're doing, they can give you feedback. So all pretty straightforward, but that's kind of that relationship. Um, but there are other relationships that might be more interactive. For instance, um, uh, the, the old concept of master and apprentice or having a protege, um, that's more interactive. That could be, you know, you're working with someone, you're interning with someone, but it's very active and it's about building the skills, right? You know, you're, you're taking them under your wing in that particular way. Um, and then you have coaches. Now coaches, I want you to think of sport because coaches watch like videotapes of athletes in action, right? You know, they, they're seeing what they're doing wrong and they can make, uh, you know, suggestions as to what you can do. You need to stretch a little further. You need to do this. And it's the same thing with any business or craft. Um, you want people who understand uh, the, the, what needs to be done and can assess where you're missing the mark. Um, and that's really valuable. Um, coaches and consultants and things like that. Um, so if you're starting a business, that's someone you can hire to bring into the process. 
and then probably my favorite, because these are, are fun ways to think about it, your advocates or your cheerleaders, right? So um, for instance, there are designers that I get very excited about, but I could never wear their clothes, right? Like Candace, I don't wear bridal gowns. I have not in the market for one. So, um, you know, but I, I sing her praises anytime I can because of the fact that I'm excited about what she does. I respect how she's doing it, all those kinds of things. So, um, so when you're asking for help, again, you wanna know who you're asking, how you're asking, why you're asking, and be clear and also respect time um, by being concise. So instead of asking, you know, uh, for a lot of their time, um, you know, try first an introductory email, maybe try to schedule an informa informational interview, and then be really prepared. Ask great questions that speak to their knowledge base because you've done your homework. Um, and you will get people who respond to you very well, not only providing you that information, but giving you the starting point for building a relationship with that person. And you can always say, oh, this was so great, you know, and, and say, I have 10 questions, you know, or I have three questions or whatever it is. Um, and then always leave it open and say, I'd love to connect with you again, you know, at the end of the semester and let you know how things went. Um, and if you're in the position of being a student, just know students have a lot of power. Most people, when they hear with you're a student, they are willing to spend a little time and share their knowledge because that's it just kind of natural. You know, when you get to a certain age or a certain level of expertise, it's exciting to have people who are passionate about what you love and what you've committed your life to. So, um, so yeah, so know that being a student is not a bad thing, <laughs> you know, like in the out in the industry, you want to uh, share that you are because again, sometimes that can get your foot in the door. But yeah, asking for help is is important to do too. You don't want to think you can just do it on your own. Um, the more the more I do in the industry, the more I realize how important communities are and asking for help and um, getting people. It's also a great way to get on people's radar, you know, because it might be you as a student right now, but when you follow up with them after graduation, you're a professional in the industry. You know, there may be a job opening up, you know, so that you just never know where relationships are going to take you. And I think that's the best way to look at asking for help as looking at it as starting to build a relationship with that person. Exactly. I always tell students to never be afraid to ask because to the person you're asking, like I know over the years, I've had so many requests for, you know, how do I get into the modeling industry? Can you, can you help me? Can you show me how to walk? And, you know, can you help me in some way? And even with the designers, you know, at, say, I know, you know, this person, can you connect me with them? And to me, it's rewarding to know that someone thinks highly enough of me, even, even from a student's view to, to think that my, you know, that I have a, a position in, in the, in the industry where they, they want to ask for help. And, and I think I've always found it really rewarding. And even a lot of the fashion icons in Boston, um, there's a few that Jay and I know well, um, you know, students and people in the industry would approach them and, you know, say, would you mind taking a look at my work? I value your opinion. And I, I, I would really, you know, be so grateful if you would just even take a few minutes just to look at my portfolio. Or can I show you one of my designs? And they love it. They, they, you know, they, it, it just made them feel so great that, you know, someone was asking. So it, it goes both ways, like never be afraid to ask because usually the person you're asking, um, you know, is going to be happy that you asked and, and willing to help. And if they can't help you, they'll connect you with, with the person in the industry that can. We're lucky in Boston because it's such a, you know, supportive um, community that we work in. I'm sure in other you know, locations, it's probably not, <laughs> you know, it might be more difficult um, to, um, you know, to ask for help from someone, but um, we're lucky that we do have a, a great fashion community. Sure, um, everybody's very supportive. Yes, that's for sure. And what are some ways a creative person can start thinking like a business person? This one is, is really important because, um, you know, a lot of people, do, you, you had said something in the very beginning that's very poignant. Um, a lot of people don't think as, of creatives as being good business people. But the truth of the matter is that the creative process is actually becoming more and more important to business because the mechanics of business is important to, are important to learn. But uh, the thinking 
the creative thinking, creative problem solving is becoming much more valuable. And even with big companies, you're seeing people from the fashion industry going into the tech industry and vice versa. Um, and I think more and more people are realizing that it's a balance, right? You need that balance. You can't be just one way or the other. Um, and it's surprising how good we can be at things, creative people can be at things, um, if they feel, if they don't feel like it's foreign, if they understand the structure, if they realize that that, that structure is a, a great setting for creativity. Because if you have a good solid sort of business base, then it gives you the freedom to be creative, right? Because you, you do need that system to interact with people. Um, and one of the big uh, splits right away is thinking about whether you're leading or managing. And that's, that's really key because some of us are really good at organizing information, at delegating tasks, you know, and that, that system that's created around business, you need someone who's really good at that. And then on the flip side, you need leaders, people who can inspire other people, people with ideas, but people with ideas with follow through that can build a team and, and, and have that be kind of the, the beginning of success. So that's probably the first thing I would say is figure out which one you're good at. You may have to provide both roles, right? You may need to be that person who is the spark or the lightning rod, you know, however you want to think about it, sort of attracting people to this idea. But then you need the management as well. You need the people who can manage the situation, set goals, you know, be good with budgets, all those kinds of things. And if you are not good at that, the first thing you should be thinking about is learning enough about that area that you can get someone on your team who's really good at it. You don't ever want to defer and just go, okay, so anybody, you know, anybody who's a biz good business person, you want it to be someone that you can have at least that conversation about. So even if you're not that main person and that's not your main goal, again, to be managing the whole business, um, you need to learn enough about it to be able to talk about it. And it's the, tr the same thing for even the fashion skills. Um, let's say you have great ideas for fashion, don't love sewing, uh, you should be able to sew well enough that you can have a conversation with a seamstress. You should know about seam allowance, how to roll a hem, you know, whatever it is, even if you're not great at it, but good enough that you, you know what you want uh, because your decisions are everything during the design process. If, you, if you're not making these decisions about how something is sewn or put together, then you're not really the designer. Even if you came up with a great sketch, you're the designer when you've made all the decisions for the process of that, or at least considered all the decisions. Um, so yeah, the leading, the managing, you want to create a great balance and, and recognize right away, even if you're in just in school right now, to say, okay, I know I'm strong there, but I'm not strong there. So I need to start building those relationships and learning as much as I can. Um, the other side of the business are uh, platforms and pipelines. So by platforms, I mean, where are you, almost like a literal platform, what platforms are you putting stuff on? This could mean social media, this could mean uh, your website, it could mean, uh, you know, where you're doing business, whether it's in a store, a physical store or online, those are the platforms. And then, um, you know, also you want to think of them as pipelines in terms of how are we getting these into our customers' hands? Right. So that's really also very key. How are you building relationships? How are you building a sales team? All those kinds of things that you can kind of uh, start to plan out now, even if it's a fantasy right now. Um, doodle, you know, on like create a, like, for instance, if you're thinking of a store, have a storefront. A storefront is a couple of rectangles, right? We can all draw those. And even if you can't draw figures yet, you can make notes and go, oh, I would have two mannequins here and think about the user experience. You know, how is it going to feel to walk in the store? What am I trying to say? So all that thinking you can have fun with now, you know, in the beginning before it's anything real, um, because then it'll inform, you'll know uh, in a very real way, based on your idea, what the business side of it is. Like, what do I need? How much money do I need to raise? All that kind of good stuff. Absolutely. I feel the, I feel the same. Um, you know, I think 
like you uh, have to have a plan for yourself. Um, start small, step by step, get to where you want to be. And some designers are really good at being a designer and being a business person. Yeah. But as you said, some just aren't. They, you know, they they're amazing designers, but they don't know how to run a business. And you have to make the decision to know that and and decide. You know, I really need to hire someone to do my books, or you know, to. Yeah. To, to budget for me or, you know, to, to be that other side, because if you don't, then, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure because you, you some people just cannot do it all. To me, you know, the whole design process is just so, it, it's overwhelming <laughs> for me. I don't think I'd be able to do it all, but there are many that do. Um, but it's great to have, you know, uh, like people that surround you that are supportive and can be part of a great team and to make you successful too. Um, what are some ways a creative person, oh, sorry. What is one of the biggest challenges of negotiating your way through the fashion industry? Um, I think optics and, and um, expectations because it's such a glossy industry on the surface, um, but it, it, more and more the entertainment side of the industry and the social media side and um, all of that plays into the optics of it all. So, um, you know, it's a very visual industry and you are, you really need to think about um, how you're being perceived. You know, it's another layer of all this. So um, I think that's, that's kind of a, a, a big factor in all of this. And perceptions and managing expectations is really key as well. Uh, because we don't want to over promise and under deliver. So this is, uh, I've seen like designers, for instance, do great fashion shows, make beautiful clothes, hire the best models, great pictures. All of a sudden the industry comes calling. They're like, yes, I'll place an order. And they get all these orders and yet they haven't, uh, they're not set up to be able to deliver on time, right? So they miss the delivery times or they accept too many offers. You know, they are orders. So they'll they'll take all the orders and then disappoint people. Like, you know, that is something you can't recover from um, or it's very hard to recover from. So it's almost better to say, again, when you're managing expectations, say, oh, what is my capacity? Like how many out, how many dresses can I make in this amount of time? Um, do I have a factory lined up? You know, like all these other elements, and then and then say, oh. We're at, we're at capacity. All the orders we can make, we can, we, um, we're, we're there. We can't make any more right now. We're not set up for it, but I can put you on a waiting list. I can, you know, and there are companies who have waiting lists for a long time. I mean, long, long waiting lists because people really want it. It's that special. So, um, you know, and I think also navigating the industry is also about uh, not feeling like you have to move at the pace of the industry. Granted, if you want to play with the big, the big, uh, the big brands, then yes, you have to follow their system, you know, and and compete on their system. But for instance, fast fashion, it it that that cycle goes so so fast. Um, but um, but then there's the 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 pushback against that, which is slow fashion, where people are ordering bespoke clothes now. They're waiting three months or six months for something. Um, so those kinds of things are investments now. So people are looking at clothes differently. So I think navigating the industry just being, I think really is about um, like knowing where you're at for real and not buying into the illusion or, or the need to impress. Because uh, of course we want to impress people with our work, but not, not feeling like pressure to do something that we know we can't deliver on. Um, you know, you hear all these stories that are, uh, oh, uh, like we said yes to everything and, um, and then it turned out okay. Those are rare. You hear those stories. I think those stories are entertained because they're so rare that people will put up with that. So just know that, again, you want to definitely, um, on whatever you promise uh, to anyone, your boss or a client, is to be able to know that you can deliver. Um, because that is that is really key. Uh, because once I think your reputation is probably the most valuable thing there, and if you ruin that right at the beginning um, or at any time, really, it's very it's much harder to come back uh, from. 
yeah, your relationship with your clients is so important because um, that will continue to build and, you know, they'll follow you for forever. Um, but if you disappoint them and you can't deliver, that could be a major problem for sure. Yeah. Um, and what about critics in fashion? Huh, this is good. Um, yes. My answer to that is yes, there are many. <laughs> critics are everywhere. Um, you know, uh, anyone off the street um, who knows nothing about fashion can have a criticism about what you do. Mm -hmm. The key to this is knowing that everyone is a critic or, or a judge at one point. Um, but you want to ask yourself, um, honestly, be honest with yourself about, is that critique helpful? Hel crit helpful critiques usually come with a suggestion. Um, granted, it may not be welcome at the time, you may not want to hear it at the time, but you want to definitely ask yourself, are enough people saying, oh, this is too tight, or um, this color scheme, I don't get it, or whatever it is, to at least consider it. So sometimes criticism can be really helpful or critiques, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but I think worse is our when we're critics of our own work. We are definitely, our inner critic is probably the most powerful voice in your head. And, um, and the one thing you wanna do is know what your relationship is with your inner critic. So you have two choices really. You can um, sort of be a, a combatant with your inner critic where the minute it speaks up, you get a little upset, you know, and you, you go, no, I'm not gonna pay attention to that, blah, blah, blah. Or you can um, have a sort of a kinder relationship with your inner critic and go, okay, this is popping up because it's trying to protect me. And, and really think of it as, okay, my, that, those voices in my head, they're there because they care and they're worried that I'm going to be disappointed or, or you know, look, look foolish or whatever it is. And once you make that relationship, you decide what the relationship is, you can easily say thank you and move on. You know, um, so that's, that's a really key thing. And then, um, and then there's also that thing about uh, the imposter syndrome, uh, where we judge ourselves, we go into a room or a situation, and we have that imposter syndrome where we think, oh, when are they going to find out that I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not this very important person that should be in this room. And that's also something you want to build a relationship with, again, because it is this sort of self-protective kind of trigger, but, um, but acknowledge it and just say, yep, that's normal. And, you know, and everybody goes through that. Everybody feels that if they, if they say they don't, they're lying. Um, so there's always a situation where that pops up. Um, so it's about your relationship with uh, both outer critics and, inner, and your inner critic. Absolutely. And I think too, you know, fashion taste is so personal. We could be sitting at a fashion show and I could, a dress could come down the runway and I would absolutely love it. And the person sitting next to me would not like it at all. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, like it depends on who the critic is. If they're, you know, saying that they didn't like your design, it's not going to, it doesn't mean that the next critic is, is you know, going, right. not going to like it. Um, yeah. So, because it, it is so personal, but I think if you get negative reviews from a lot of press where they say, oh, the fabric choice was was not good for, you know, the fall collection, then you think in your mind, well, next time I'm not going to choose a fabric like that, because if, if the majority of the press didn't like it, that's helpful, you know, so some criticism can be good. Um, but a lot of it you just can't take to heart, because as a designer, if you know that you are, you know, that you're creating good work, you're, you know, that you're, that you're talented and that um, everything about your design is quality, then stay true to your vision because, you know, there, there are so many people that that's why we have so many different designers from streetwear to evening wear, because every, right. there's, you know, there's something for everyone and designers should always know that they don't have to change who they are just because they get some negative criticism. Right. And I think, sometimes people take feedback as criticism right exactly so, you know, it could be feedback um there's uh the rental companies like rent the runway mm -hmm. um they work with designers designers some designers design specific things for rent the runway mm -hmm. and the feedback that they get is incredibly helpful to the designer 
because they'll, you know, they'll say things like, oh, I love this dress, but I wish it had pockets or, um, or they have two dress, two choices a floral print and a solid. And the solid one is the one that gets rented all the time and people want more colors right away. That's, you know, that's information that, that a designer should be open to rather than, um, being a little too precious with a particular idea, because if you're a designer, you can design many things. It's not limited. And, and like you said, in a room, you might have, you know, with 10 people, you have 10 different opinions about that dress, so. True. <laughs> um, and how should someone in the industry be thinking about their brand? Okay, so a lot of people think that a brand is all about their logo or their, you know, um, you know the, the design of their website or of their store. And that's just the surface part of it. You know, that is what everything else transla translates into visually is, you know, it translates into that, uh, that aesthetic. But really the brand is what you and your company stand for. So what's important to you? What kind of aesthetic is important to you? What kind of social issues are important to you? Like all those things factor in and, and create, uh, help you create that brand aesthetic as well as your choices, right? Because if you're um, against animal cruelty, right? You, we're never gonna see leather in your collection. We're never gonna see fur in your collection. The minute you do put it in your collection, then your brand is being undermined by that choice. So a brand helps you keep, you know, uh, a focus on what you're about. And uh, the other thing about it, and, and though, of course, you own your brand, right, your company, um, but really, who really owns your brand is your customer. Because the minute they stop believing in what you're about, or stop, you know, or see you act in ways that don't reflect your brand, they step away because they have the power because they are the ones who actually purchase the clothes or, or the product or the service. So you always want to remember that um, it's kind of like the design process. It goes back to the design process of designing a garment. Um, it, is, it is not like making art in the sense that you are, um, you are doing, you're challenging yourself to do something creative. That's definitely a part of it, but it's not the only thing. Um, when you're designing, as, uh, clothing in particular, but anything that you're designing, you have to be thinking uh, about a dialogue because you are serving someone else's needs. You're not making yourself clothes. You're making someone's clothes for a specific occasion or, you know, or who wants to feel a certain way. So uh, it kind of speaks to the brand as well. Like, you know, they are expecting you to, all your decisions to be in line with what you're about what's meaningful to you and what your brand stands for. When you, when you see that logo, you know what that means. Right. Like a, you think of, you know, like a Nike, the logo, as soon right. as you see it in, in your mind, you know, you think athleticism, endurance, performance, right. strength, that all those, it, 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 yeah, it just comes to mind. And, you know, as a designer, when you get your brand to a certain level, whatever it happens to be, that logo will, give that the person that's looking at it that same view if it's chanel you know they think luxury and um, right. sophistication elegance it just comes to your mind and and that's you know a goal is to get to the point where your brand just three words can describe your brand because everyone knows it so well yeah and it's not something that you get automatically no like people think i have a logo i have a brand no a brand is something you build build something living that continues to grow Right. Um, because your logo, like Starbucks is a great example, their logo has changed over time. It's still mm -hmm. the mermaid, but the art has changed. The colors have changed. They've become more modern and refined and it will probably continue to develop. So, um, and it's, that's true of, of, again, of any brand. Right. Absolutely. I think we're- Yes, I was just checking. Um, uh, Amy, are you, I don't know if you're there, but I didn't know if we have any questions from uh, the audience because I know we have about- 10 minutes or so? Yeah, um, we don't yet, but I would encourage people that this is the time okay. to put questions in chat or Q&A. But I just would like to say personally that your discussion resonates with me so much because I just finished a master's degree program in creative writing. Oh, wow. And 
Right. Um, and it was fabulous. It was great. It was so creative. I generated so much work. And then right at the end, just before we graduated, the uh, my mentor said, you know, we can teach you about the arts, but you're on your own about the business part of it, about you know, like go out in the world and be successful, but we can't, we have nothing to say about how you do that. And so I, I've been floundering a little bit for six months, kind of like, okay, how do I pivot from this really creative, exciting, amazing experience and somehow make it into something concrete that ends up being published. And, uh, and so I, I, even though you're talking about fashion, I, I find it really applies to things I'm thinking about. Excellent. That's good so, to know. It's, yeah. yeah. And um, the inner critic thing is the, like, that was really helpful to me too. Cause I thought was, I was the only one that had an imposter syndrome. So it's helpful <laughs> to know I'm not. <laughs> I know it's, sometimes the students get so stressed trying to finish a design because they constantly keep rethinking it and their you know their inner critic is telling them oh you shouldn't have done that you shouldn't have done this and they rework it so many times yeah, um, yeah. Until they, because they you know some there's some of them are somewhat of perfectionists so yeah. undermine your efforts absolutely yeah. yeah and also the cycles of creativity because i was super creative for a couple of months after graduating and then the last three months i haven't done anything right. and i was like oh my god i'm never gonna write again <laughs> but i think it's just you know it goes like this and you Absolutely. just have to follow it and downtime is really important i mean especially if you're conscious that it's downtime because it could feel like oh i haven't done anything but the truth of the matter is you might have been exposing yourself to uh, other you know other writing or you know or just coming um, kind of uh, letting yourself have ideas just kind of float up so it's it's very key to know that um, that no time is really wasted uh, because a lot of you like I know myself like when I have downtime I feel guilty so uh, you need to kind of allow yourself to have that downtime sometimes too. Yeah, that's great advice. And and I think being curious is also helpful because ideas don't happen in a vacuum for me right. anyway. It's like I have to be engaged with something and then the ideas start to flow. So, but anyway, I think Janet might have had a question. Yeah, yeah well, and just um, same as Amy, I actually, but I was lived in New York briefly and I got my life coaching certification and the same thing, they teach you all these skills. So I'm very familiar with inner critics. Um, I have a whole workshop I could do on them um, <laughs> and they don't go away necessarily. But anyway, um, but also there's a sense of like, okay, you're going to be a life coach. It's like, but how, like, how do I get clients? Like, how do I convince people that this is valuable when it's so intangible? Um so I like a lot of what you talked about is true. Like you kind of just have to get out there and sort of figure it out. And mm -hmm. something that came to mind that I grapple with there's, I mean, in coaching and fashion, there's all these different ways to go about in different um, types of companies, like big companies, small companies that, and I think a lot about ethics and principles and like, you know, one's not better than the other, but following those and kind of creating that balance of, all right, when do I say I need a J-O-B and I have to like right. rent? And when do I say, no, this principle is really important to me and I don't care if it means it takes 10 years longer. Right. Um, and it's, I was just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think it's about aligning yourself. You know I mean? You, you want to do the research, for instance, and know what companies are out there that are doing something I care about or in a way that I care about. Um, but I, there's also the side of... Um, like when it comes to the it, a little bit is the imposter syndrome or or here here's the the word I'm looking for um, amateur amateur is usually such a dirty word in the industry or in anything creative and I always think about the Olympics because amateur status those those athletes are at their peak right so they are the best in the world at what they do. And the only difference is in the only thing that puts them in amateur status is that they don't get paid to do it or don't, you know, have money for what for their services. So they are doing it for the love of it. Right. That's the root of that word. So um, and I think that's the key, because I know that uh, some very su successful creative people um, don't mind having the day job. And because then they can do their creative side on their terms. And I think that's kind of a little underrated in our industry because it's really kind of a cottage industry. It's all these, you know, sole proprietors who have this little company. They might have an Etsy shop 
or, um, or, or go to fairs or whatever it is. And they sustain um, a, a business that way. Again, it may not be this huge business, but it is something that where they're doing it for the love of it. And, um, and I, I don't think that gets enough credit. People feel like you have to have this big company and have huge shows. Um, but there is uh, a big satisfaction in being, again, uh, having that freedom. If you have a job that's, you know, paying the rent and paying the bills, and then it allows you even to make time for your creative work, you know, because you can say my weekends are this or my evenings are that. So that is something I have to keep in mind, because, again, not everyone is going to be, uh, you know, Chanel. So uh, there's definitely people who will rise up to those levels, but um, the game is different. And, and I think the key here is that you want to define your success so that it's on your terms, uh, because then, then success is real. It isn't someone else's definition of success that you have trying to meet. It's your definition. And if that makes you happy and you're making beautiful things and you're sharing them with the world, uh, that is everything, you know, that is the goal for everybody. Cause you know, we often think of, oh, I'm going to make it up, you know, rise up the ladder. So I have time to do these things casually or, you know, on my own time. And you can do that from the beginning. It just is set up differently. I always just say, take the risk and try it. <laughs> I had yeah. a couple of other businesses on Nantucket. I had the Nantucket doll collection and ACK originals. And I thought, because when I had the modeling career, I never wanted to go into the industry. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And then my brother was a doctor and he said, he was interning and he said, oh my God, you'll, you'll never have your summers on Nantucket again. Like, so Nantucket had a big effect on my career. So I said, and I had gotten the, um, uh, the offer to, you know, be a, be a model and be the assistant director of the agency at the time. And he said, take it. You'll, you'll, it'll be so much fun. It'll be so much better. I'm killing myself now. So then when I did that, then he said, why don't you start a business? So I thought, well, maybe I'll start a business. I went to Harvard Extension School just to learn how to start a business because my degree was in psychology and biology. I had no idea. And then I just decided, well, I love children and my niece was little and she loved her dolls. And I started, so I started this little company that took a doll collection. I sold them at pinwheels and I loved it. Um, I did it for years. And then I did like nautical jewelry and I patented a Nantucket basket design. And I just kept like, you know, I wrote a book in 2005 called the Nantucket diet. I just kept like, you know, working my way through different parts and I would just try it. And um, then the concierge business came up and it just got too busy to sustain all of it. But um, I think you just have to like get out there and give it a start. <laughs> No, it's really important. I mean, what one of the things uh, that's really key is um, not letting go, in particular in fashion, yeah. is not letting go of the making. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't have a company that sells a collection anymore, but I take every opportunity, like Jane was saying, you know, like trying different things. Um, if there's a project where I can get back to making and um, I make sure that I, you know, that I um, say yes, because um, those you don't want to lose touch with um, the reason why you start this interest came about or you started in the industry. You want to keep that alive, and the best way to do that, again, even if you're not don't have a company, um, is to keep doing it because you just never know what are, what kind of opportunities are going to pop up, what things are going to lead to. So true. Well, we have a shy group tonight, and I don't see any oh. questions um, in the chat or the Q&A. So um, I don't know. Do you have any, any final words for us this evening? And thank you so much for sharing your time and, um, and your thoughts and all that. So Jane, you want to go first? Well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. Um, I would just say never give up on your dream. Just just you know, if you have something in mind that you want to do for your future, just go for it. Um, and I will share the last line of the book, which is um, always keep innovating you. So, you know, you are your own best project and you want to craft the life that you want or the career that you want. So, um, you know, just always be exploring new things and, um, and innovating within uh, the, the choices you make. Excellent. Okay. Oh, oh, wait, here we go. We have a last minute. Um, what's it's, the title of the book? It's called What They Didn't Teach You in Fashion School. 
but you say you could apply it in a, in a variety of ways. Yes. I mean, I've gotten um, people, friends who are not in the industry have read the book and brought to my attention that all the steps, although, you know, obviously we're talking about, you know, particular things like, you know, uh, you know, sewing and construction in certain areas, but really the idea behind the book and the breakdown of all the chapters or these keys um, really lends itself to whatever you're doing. You know, I had a, a banker tell me that this lent itself in terms of how that, that he had to think about how he dressed for work and how he presented. And, you know, even with, with you know, we think of portfolios being just about art, but, you know, you have the world of finance where portfolios show a measure of success, you know, and, and what your choices were. So really it, they're transferable skills and um, can apply to almost everything. Great. I know you've written a whole bunch of books. Do you have ones in the works right now? Uh, not, no, nothing officially in the works right now. <laughs> How many? You have, you've written like five, right? Uh, written three on my own, and then I collaborated with two on two others. That's a lot. <laughs> I aspire to that. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, you're getting some love and thank yous in the Q&A, oh, but uh -huh. I don't see any more questions. Okay. So um, I think we'll call it an evening. And thank you okay. again so much to Jay and to Jane for joining us tonight. All right. Thank My you. pleasure. Have a good night, everybody. Thank Take you, care, everyone. Bye.